Good afternoon. As always, I love the fellowship. I think it's a very important part of our service to the Commonwealth, but with your permission, we'll go ahead and get started. We've got two great groups here with us today. Uh, Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Senator Boswell, Senator Frankie Frommeyer, Senator Gardler, Senator Harper Angel, Senator Howell, Senator Mills, Senator Storm, Senator Thomas, Senator Wheeler, Senator Wilson, Representative All. Here. Representative Baker. Here. Representative Dotson. Here. Representative Fister. Here. Representative Frazier Gordon. Representative Freeland. Present. Representative Fugit. Here. Representative Grossberg. Representative Heath. Representative Kokarni. Representative Lawrence. Representative Maddox. Here. Representative Massaroni. Here. Representative McPherson. Here. Representative Pollock. Here. Representative Reed. Here. Representative Roberts. Representative Stalker. Present. Representative Tackett Lafferty. Representative Tate. Here. Representative Timoney. Here. Representative Truitt. Representative Wesley. Here. Representative White. Here. Representative Wilson. Representative Witten. Here. Co-Chair Wise, Co-Chair King. Present. Co-Chair Pratt. Present. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I appreciate the House coming to uh, attend our meeting today. We appreciate that. <laughs> Do I have a motion to approve our minutes from last meeting? I saw Vice Chair McPherson. Second. <laughs> Representative Pfister. Here they go. Here they go. Here they go. <laughs> We'll, we'll complete our thought on, <laughs> on minutes. All in favor of approving our minutes from last meeting? Aye. Any opposed? Our minutes are approved. What is your preference? Do you want to take that as they come in or we can go? Okay, very good. We'll let further members get settled as our first group approaches the presenting table. We have two, I think, very, very interesting groups today. You know, Central Kentucky, Kentucky, uh, our nation overall, we've got some extraordinary history to share with our immediate neighbors and the entire world. And today we're going to be talking about two major celebrations that we're talking about uh, currently in Kentucky. And the first is with our Camp Nelson National Monument. They are in the midst of celebrating their 160th anniversary. So we have two wonderful folks here with us today to tell us a little bit more about that. What I'm hoping is members from all across the state, you can take this information home and hopefully we can um, get our attendance up at these uh, wonderful events. It will benefit all of us and make us stronger and more educated about our history. So there is a little button on your microphone. If you will push that until it illuminates. For the record, please introduce yourselves and then proceed with your presentation. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ernie Price, uh, Superintendent, Camp Nelson National Monument. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Steve Fan, and I serve as the Chief of Interpretation, Education, and Visitor Services at Camp Nelson National Monument. Thank you, uh, Representative King. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, distinguished members of, of the inter, uh, Joint Committee of Tourism, Small Business, and Information Technology. Um, my name is Ernie Price, and as you met Steve Fan, and we are with the National Park Service. Um, it's an honor to speak with you here in the seat of government for the great Commonwealth of Kentucky. Kentucky's history is not only deep and rich and meaningful to its citizens, but it's the history that's found here is meaningful and important to anyone who seeks to truly understand the complicated history of our nation. And it's a great source of tourism too. Camp Nelson, like Kentucky, is a window into America's complicated soul. Today, we'd like to provide a brief update on the National Park Service, and specifically Camp Nelson National Monument in Jesmond County. Uh, Kentucky is not only the ge geographical center of the evolution of our young nation, 
but it's also the center of many of America's toughest challenges, which may explain why the number of National Park Service units in Kentucky has been growing in recent years. So, first question, how many National Park units are there in the Commonwealth of Kentucky? Does anyone here represent a district where there is a National Park unit? Besides Representative King, of course. Any, yes, sir? Abraham Lincoln's birthplace. Very good. Abraham Lincoln birthplace. Yes, sir. I've heard of Mammoth Cave. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Anyone else? All right. So the answer is seven. I like to refer to them as the Magnificent Seven. Um, yes, Abraham Lincoln birthplace, of course, in Mammoth Cave. Uh, and along with Cumberland Gap, uh, I would say they're probably the most recognizable names of National Park units uh, in, in Kentucky. Uh, and I should say that of the seven, we have several parks that actually are shared among states. Uh, Cumberland Gap, of course, being in, in a tri-state park with Virginia and Tennessee. Big South Fork National River and Recreation Area uh, is also a part of Tennessee. Uh, and Fort Donelson, fellow Civil War Park, is actually in Tennessee. But Fort Hyman within that unit is, is in Kentucky. Uh, but I also want to mention the opportunity that we have here to think about the National Park Service and a place like Camp Nelson going forward are the two new sites. Uh, Camp Nelson added to the National Park Service in 2018 and Mill Springs Battlefield near Somerset uh, in 2019, making, as I said, this magnificent seven. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get through the presentation. So what I would like to do now is, uh, yeah, just want to hold that shot right there for a moment and is talk about as briefly as I can, just a few minutes, about what is Camp Nelson. What was it historically? Uh, Steve and I have worked at a lot of national park units all over the country, and, it's, and particularly Civil War sites. But even the most ardent Civil War enthusiasts, and there are a lot of them, and, and, and that's, that's a serious thing, even some of them don't really know what Camp Nelson is. And I think the reason is because it's not a battlefield like Shiloh, Vicksburg, and so many other places uh, in, a, in the American lexicon. So I'm going to attempt something very difficult, which is about a three and a half minute uh, history lesson right after lunch. So wish me luck. Uh, we're going to start uh, by going back to 1863. So that's the landscape today. That's a, that's a photograph from just about the same spot. Uh, and, and what you'll notice is all of the stuff, buildings, wagons, ambulances, and nooks and crannies all over the place. Camp Nelson was a supply depot for the United States military. And its, its sole purpose when it was built in the summer of 1863 was to uh, hoard all the supplies needed to launch a campaign to Knoxville, Tennessee in August of 1863, 160 years ago. So the weekend before last, uh, Representative King uh, referenced uh, uh, a big event that we had that Steve envisioned and executed very well. Uh, it, was, it was that 160th. But Camp Nelson, unlike Shiloh and Vicksburg, it doesn't have a single anniversary. It was a camp that existed from 1863 to 1866. Things happened throughout that time. And not one event is our only anniversary. So uh, it was Steve's vision to uh, commemorate the, the founding of the camp in April of 63, the Knoxville campaign in the, in the summer of 63. Next year, 24 and 25 and 26, we'll have other events that commemorate the 160th events of other significant things that happened uh, at Camp Nelson. Uh, but suffice it to say, in 1863, Camp Nelson became this very large supply depot, about 4,000 acres, nestled between the Kentucky River and Hickman Creek. And you, you, I know you're very familiar with the palisades that those things create, and it made Camp Nelson an impenetrable peninsula, only vulnerable to the north, facing Lexington. And the reason that's important to our story as I move into 1864 is the, the U.S. Army engineers realized that there needed to be a system of fortifications and forts built along the northern side of Camp Nelson, and they would use impressed laborers to do that. Uh, African-American men who were enslaved in counties around central Kentucky, their owners would be paid by the U.S. government to have these men and eight women come into uh, and, and build Camp Nelson. 
Uh, there were 1,900 of these folks uh, that that happened to. So let's go to 1864. And before I do, I have something else I want to say. It is so impressive to consider the scope and scale of Camp Nelson. This is an 1866 map uh, of the camp. You see the, the bend in the Kentucky River there. That north-south artery running right through the camp is, is the Danville-Lexington Turnpike, Highway 27 today. Uh, and what it, it's... It, it blows my mind to understand that there was running water in this camp in 1864. And I don't know how much you, you think about or have considered the American Civil War, but running water in a military camp is not something you would normally associate as having. They pumped that picture on the left with a 50 horsepower steam engine. They pumped water up an eight inch pipe, 470 feet up the Palisade uh, at, at 125 gallons a minute into that reservoir, the bottom photograph, which was 500,000 gallons, and then they would run water through gravity through lead pipes into the different parts of the camp. And, and it actually wasn't to provide water uh, for the people, which, which we need, uh, but it was for the animals. They could stable 2,000 horses and mules, and they could corral 12,000 horses and mules at the same time. At times, there were more than 10,000 people in this camp. Now, for those of you that aren't aware of what Lexington was like in 1864, there were moments that Camp Nelson was larger than Lexington. It's crazy to think that, looking at these rolling pastures today, that all that was there. Now, in 1864, Camp Nelson might have closed because the Knoxville campaign was successful. Uh, East, East Tennessee was fully in Union hands by, by early 64, and it, it might have closed, mission accomplished, but Kentucky changed military policy in April and May of 64 that would forever change Camp Nelson, and it's the reason that Steve and I are sitting here right now. The policy change said that now uh, black men in Kentucky would be allowed to enlist in the United States military even without their owner's permissions. Game changer. Now, over the next two years, 64-65, Kentucky would see a little over 23,000 black men enjoy, join the U.S. military in Kentucky. Now, there were other black Kentuckians that left Kentucky earlier and joined, but in Kentucky, just over 23,000. Over 10,000 of those men enlisted, trained, and recruited at Camp Nelson, making it arguably almost the second largest recruiting station for USCTs, again, United States Colored Troops, which is what they were known as then, these units, uh, in the nation, uh, New Orleans being number one and Camp Nelson being very close to Camp William Penn in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So it, it is remarkable. It is nationally significant. Uh, there's a picture here of some guys that are, are cavalrymen. There were four infantry units, two cavalry uh, units, and two heavy artillery units of, U of USCTs that formed at Camp Nelson. Uh, and we have some great photographs uh, of, of the camp that were taken during the war. In 1865, the other big chapter uh, to remember is that when these thousands of men came into the camp, many of them did not come alone. And remember, many of them had left their farms in places of enslavement without permission. So imagine your wife and your children after you've made such a decision. Many of these family members came with these men. And so then Camp Nelson also became a major refugee center. Over 3,000 women and children and elderly men who were, who were ineligible, uh, not of military fighting age, poured into Camp Nelson. This did not suit the military command, most of them very well. People who couldn't contribute directly to the military calls were really considered in the way. Uh, throughout the summer and fall of 1864, these folks were systematically expelled at least seven times out of the camp. In late November, the last time that it happened, it was during an early snowstorm for central Kentucky. And of the more than 400 people that were expelled, over 100 of them were died as a result. This news went viral, meaning newspapers all over the country. And uh, policy would change inside Camp Nelson and across the nation. Inside Camp Nelson, the military would now build what was called the Home for Colored Refugees, 97 of these cottages on the west side of Highway 27. Uh, also, on March 3rd, 1865, Congress would pass an act that would state that any enslaved person, man, woman, or child who can reach a federal installation would be emancipated, not just if they fought as soldiers. 
Now, that piece of history is often lost because of the surrender that occurs a month after that. The war ends, but that policy did happen, and it was a direct result of Camp Nelson. Again, nationally significant. Okay, history lesson done. Probably went a little over. Um, the numbers. Already said it. Uh, Camp Nelson is 18 miles south uh, of Lexington. Um, park was created actually in 1998 by Jesmond County. And we owe uh, a debt to Jesmond County, we, the American people, uh, for setting this park aside in the first place. Um, and they, they did it on a shoestring budget. They did it with a lot of just want to. And, and they purchased three farms that made up the core of that camp, which is now the National Monument, which was officially proclamated in October of 2018. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to remind folks that when that happened, there were no Park Service staff there. The county continued to run the park for three years under a co-management agreement. So Steve and I and our teammates didn't start truly running the park until October 21 as a full National Park Service site. So if it feels like we're less than two years old, it's because in many ways we kind of are. Uh, it just makes me that much more proud of what we have accomplished. So uh, more numbers. Uh, as national parks go compared to Mammoth Cave, we're very small staff. Uh, but again, we're proud of what we've done. The building behind us is called the White House, the Oliver Perry home. And if anybody's driven up and down 27 in Jasmine County, this is the one thing you might see of Camp Nelson that would be recognizable, a bit iconic. The house was built in 1855 and it was officers quarters during the war. It's precious to us because it's one of the few surviving uh, man-made structures from the camp that's there today. And so we've got a lot of work due to analyze and preserve that home uh, and eventually get it reopened to the public. But here's our, our staff. Uh, it's a picture taken last year. And as you can see, it's a combination of Park Service employees, uh, paid interns, uh, and volunteers uh, that are all making this, this happen. Uh, in FY23, I can say we are now fully funded, as we say in the Park Service. And so we're, we're adding a couple of more folks right now, currently. Uh, so we're looking at about 10 to 11 positions with, a, with a, a healthy number of interns and volunteers to do the job. I'm, I'm sure y'all are used to seeing graphs of money. Uh, I, I know we have to do this sometimes, too. But this is kind of Camp Nelson's budget in a, in a, in a, in a quick glance. We got our first federal funding in, in FY20. That blue color represents what we call our base funding. And that's what we get for all of our fixed costs, our, our staffing, utilities, and things that we just have to pay every year. Um, that, that burnt orange color above it, though, that represents project dollars. Now, these are projects that Steve and I and our other colleagues uh, will, will write to compete across the nation for Park Service available funds for special projects like working on the White House, uh, archaeology, uh, and we'll talk about things like that here in a moment. And I'm very proud of this graph because as we've gone along, we're seeing that we're, we're almost getting, in some cases, more project dollars than we are base funding. Uh, and so, again, our, our little staff is mighty and, and doing good work in that area, too. So we expect in 24, of course, we don't have our 24 base budget yet. Uh, we expect it to go down a little bit, but we're also expecting to get more project dollars in 24. Uh, and what this means is these projects, they allow us to... to uh, work with vendors and contractors to get these projects done. That does bring a lot of dollars into central Kentucky. Not all of our, our contracts are with local vendors, but often they are the most competitive uh, being so close to us. And so I think that is important from a tourism and an economic development standpoint. Visitation. Now, you know, caveat here, um, we, we arrived during the pandemic. <laughs> Uh, the visitor center was closed, in fact. The county had already closed it when we got here. We reopened it in June 21, finally. And these two lines, the orange line below, uh, represents the number of visitors that come directly into our visitor center that we meet face-to-face -face inside. The blue line represents the people that come into the park. And the point here is, is that we get a lot of people that use our park not only to learn more about history, but there's birding, there's walking, walking dogs, ham radio operators. There's a number of things that happen in this green, beautiful green space just 18 miles outside of Lexington. We see a lot of Fayette County tags and are a lot after 5 o'clock, especially this time of year when nobody wants to visit right now. Uh, 7 o'clock this evening will be a little more pleasant. 
But the other point about this graph is not that we're getting mammoth cave numbers, because we certainly are not, but we are steadily going up. And, and that's, that looks to still be the case going into this next year. Uh, in June and July of this year, we're already 15% up over last year, which was over 60% up from the year before. So um, we don't get a huge amount of visitation, but we are very optimistic uh, as we are watching visitation increase steadily. You probably can't read all of that. I understand that. But I, I wanted to share this with you because when I found out that I was going to have the honor of addressing this specific committee, the, park, the National Park Service uh, decided to uh, really oblige me. And on Monday, two days ago, released this economic impact information for the National Park Service across the country. So this is fresh off the press. So obviously, I called out uh, specifically Kentucky. And, and you may not be able to read all of those things, but basically this is visitor spending and economic impact in areas where national parks are based on the number of visitors that are visiting national parks in different areas. Um, I, I, I knew we didn't have time to break down every single national park, but as, as, as a state, Kentucky, uh, you can see there $114 million of visitor spending. And by the way, this is 2022. Uh, and then the different categories there. It's not just the people that come into the park. It's the hotels and the restaurants and the gas stations and everything, and even the recreational opportunities that people take advantage of while they're at national parks and when they come into an area. So I, I think it is something very important for us to understand that we don't, we don't operate in a vacuum and the economic impacts are not in a vacuum. Um, next. I would now like to get into the present. Camp Nelson today. And I'm, I'm going to just share with you a, a, a little bit of a photo album of things just to kind of give you a sense. It, it, if I may, with a show of hands, I'm, I'm just curious, how many people have had the opportunity to actually go to Camp Nelson? So there's, there's, there's a few. Excellent. Good. Understand. And I, I understand the Commonwealth's a large place, east to west especially. Um, but We've got, we, as I mentioned before, we do a lot of commemoration programs. And the reason that I elaborated earlier about those 1,900 impressed laborers that, that, that helped build Camp Nelson is the weekend before last, we had a host of volunteers and staff that researched, thanks to, we, have, we employ uh, several uh, student workers from University of Kentucky, uh, PhD candidates in history. Professor Amy Taylor at the University of Kentucky is a huge asset to the park. Uh, and a collective effort to, and this would not have happened when I started my park service career in the 1980s. I would have been told, oh, we'll never know the names of those impressed laborers. You can't find that out. That's oral history and unreliable. Well, we now know the names of each of those 1,900 people that were impressed into labor in 1863 at Camp Nelson. And 1,900 of these flags were put out along the entrenchment line that they built in the summer of 1863, and their names were written on each flag. Most of the flags were white. Some of them are blue. Ninety-eight of them are blue. They are the, are the folks that we know for sure that were impressed laborers in 1863, and then when the policy changed in the spring of 64, came back to Camp Nelson as soldiers in the United States Army. Uh, and you can see Private Jackson there of the 124th United States Colored Infantry in the foreground of this shot. Um, so, that was what happened just this weekend before last. And I just want to use it as an example of, of the kind of meaning and depth uh, of these stories that can be that can be mined at Camp Nelson. Um, down in the bottom bottom left, in the past two falls, we've had luminaria programs to commemorate those expulsions that we talked about. Uh, the first one we did was in the fall of 21. This photo you see was from 22. And here we have luminarias for the 400 folks that were expelled from the camp. It's difficult to see in the photo, but if you look closely, some of those luminarias are darker than others. And the darker ones represent the 102 people that were actually lost as a result of that expulsion. And it's been really powerful for us uh, to engage with the community around Nicholasville, Jasmine County, and believe me, far beyond. We've had folks from Louisville and other places come to these programs uh, to just find their own meaning. Uh, in these stories. Uh, I think all Kentuckians and all Americans really are connected to these stories. Bottom right is also from the weekend before last. Again, it was the 160th of the arrival of the U.S. Army at Camp Nelson. 
and August 63. And literally, Steve managed to get about 100 living history reenactors to come into the park. And, and that's a shot of the infantry. It represents the 21st Massachusetts as they arrived at Camp Nelson. What you don't see in the photograph is there's literally uh, two mules drawing a wagon full of supplies. There are also civilians. There's Drum and Fife leading this, uh, this parade. And it, it was really a phenomenal sight to see. Uh, so we invite y'all to come out to future programs to, to have these kinds of experiences. But that was a special event. We are always doing public programming at Camp Nelson. Uh, Ranger-led programs like you see in some of the, the pictures here. Um, uh, now that shot up there top, I just want you to see kind of the scope and scale of these 1900 flags during one of our Ranger programs. Uh, but they, like I said, they happen uh, really almost daily year round. Uh, on the left there, something very popular with, with national parks across the country. Those of you that have had kids and have traveled across the country, Junior Ranger, uh, activities are, are a phenomenal way for parents to help their kids have great experiences at national parks. Because when I take my daughter to a park and I know nothing about the park, this is my cheat sheet. And we, we go through it together uh, and, and we get to earn a badge, uh, even Junior Ranger badge. So um, uh, that's a great way to engage with the park. As I mentioned, bird watching, we get a lot of birders, especially in the springtime. Uh, and there's one of our rangers, Sarah, leading a, a bird program there. School programs. Now, again, arriving in COVID, that was a difficult time, but I'm happy to say that since then, uh, we've started to see a lot more uh, school programs. Our very own uh, Corporal Steve here in his artillery jacket there leading his fearless company across the park there. Um, one of our other rangers, education rangers, leading an archaeology uh, exercise. Archaeology is a big deal uh, at Camp Nelson. It has been when it was a county park, and it will be again as a national park unit, too. Uh, the, the stories that we need to tell at Camp Nelson, many of them lie just under the surface. Uh, and also, too, Steve's team has been ex uh, developing new exhibits. Uh, so even if you have been to Camp Nelson, come back. Uh, we just opened up a new exhibit this summer uh, called a Soldier's Exhibit. Uh, that features the experience of white and black soldiers during the Civil War, how they were similar, but how they were also very different. It's a powerful exhibit. It's very well done. And, of course, the sheer physical improvements, infrastructure. Uh, I mentioned the White House. That's actually more what it looked like. Um, we are doing a, we're doing a historic structures report uh, on, on the, the, the home, as we did for a church, as another historic structure we have in the park, so that we can have full-blown preservation projects done on those. Uh, we, we're bringing in more cannons to put in these forts so people can understand that, you know, that earlier picture with all of that stuff. It's difficult to imagine that when you're there today. So we want to put out some of these non-architectural features on the landscape, uh, flour barrels for the bakery, the cannon in the, in the forts, and uh, all kinds of apparatuses used in the, in the, in the uh, stables and the, and the corrals so people can understand uh, what happened at the camp and how large it was. This was a volunteer event at the bottom of the, of the page here where people came out and painted cannon carriages for a day. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. And then, of course, improving and expanding our trail system. We have about five miles of trails in the camp now. Uh, I, think that I think that will easily double over the next three to five years and improve building these, uh, these staircases where they're needed, making trails more accessible and safe. Uh, long term, too, preservation. That's the Fee Church there. The Fee Church actually sits on the grounds of where the Home for Colored Refugees was. That picture you saw earlier was taken at this spot. Um, that picture up top, nobody's playing golf or whatever else that looks like. That's actually scanning the ground. It's an archaeological scan using ground-penetrating radar and magnetometry to, to examine what's underneath the ground without actually disturbing it yet. And you can imagine 465 acres. You just don't want to dig all that up. You want to learn as much as you can about it before you do. So we're engaged in a lot of that. We have an archaeological overview and assessment program that's going on now, a cultural landscape report that's been done. It's a lot of research to understand this precious resource that we have and, and how to get the most out of it. Again, three to five years, uh, archaeology there. Uh, expanding of the trails in the middle. That odd gray map with all those red dots is showing us where trails can expand and where we can put out these, these wayside exhibits to explain where you're standing and what it is you're seeing. And no doubt having historic photographs where the camera was when it took it. So you can see that topography and appreciate it. Bottom right, redoing our uh, museum exhibitry. 
uh, bringing it more up to date and taking advantage of all these photographs that we have and being able to have our interpretive rangers actually walk into and be a part of those photographs and explain exactly what it is you're looking at. The visitor center at the top right, affectionately known to us sometimes as Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, it serves us well, but but we need some work there. And we've got projects now for it and the barracks building in the bottom left to totally redo the envelopes of those buildings, take them back to their natural wood stain finish, replace all the windows. It's an energy efficiency project as well. And that picture on the and the, on the left side there in the middle, I, I know that detail can't really be seen well, but the point of that picture is, if you have been to the park, we're going to redesign the parking lot and basically triple our capacity for parking, oversized vehicles, bus drop-offs. We're also going to increase our accessibility and capacity, an exterior restroom facility, and an orientation entry plaza outside the visitor center. Because the truth is, we do go home at some point. And after five o'clock, when people arrive, we want them to be able to walk up to the front of this visitor center and be able to orient themselves to where they're standing and to answer that question, what was Camp Nelson, even if the visitor center is not open? And so these are, these are some of the improvements that, that we would like to make. So I don't even have, how are we doing? All right, plenty of time. We've, we've used up plenty of time. What questions might there be about Camp Nelson uh, and, and the future? Do we have any questions or comments from committee members? While you're thinking of a question or a comment, if we could go back, I don't see a slide number in our packet, <clears throat> but they're back to back um, showing the trajectory since 2022 of visitation and then the economic impact is the next slide after that. Right. <clears throat> Do we know what is, uh, encouraging this wonderful growth? I mean, is it mar marketing the actual designation? Well, and I appreciate Congressman Barr's work on getting our absolutely. national mom monument actually uh, officially designated. So was it the official designation, some type of marketing? What's, what's going on there? So great question, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, absolutely. Well, look, first and foremost, I think um, with all due respect to what Jesmond County did, because we will forever be indebted to, with what they did. Um, but becoming a national monument and part of the National Park Service from a marketing standpoint, it is a game changer. It literally puts us on the national map of national parks, that one we showed earlier of Kentucky's Magnificent Seven. The previous version of that map, we weren't on there. And, and for those of you that might have picked up this map, um, this brochure of the park, on the inside of it, on the map itself, there's a, there's a little blue stamp down there, and it's actually dated today's date. Uh, and this is part of the passport program that national parks uh, have. And, and if you haven't seen it, you wouldn't believe it. This is a culture. There are so many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that travel the country to get their passport stamps at every national park unit in the country. And so by getting on that passport uh, map, too, it was a big deal. And, and I just put that in here. We put this in here so you could see what one of these stamps look like. They're, it's dated, and it has the exact place of where you are. And there's actually books published, like album books, that you can stamp and get them filled out as you travel. So I think those were huge uh, game changers for the visitation to the monument. I, I, but but let, me, let me qualify something. The National Park Service is forbidden by law to use public dollars to market itself. And that's not all. That's, I don't think that's widely known. Uh, there are other federal agencies that can if you've ever watched the Super Bowl. Um, but you won't see us on there. But you might see the National Park Foundation. You might see the Friends of the Smoky Mountains. You might see the foundation at Gettysburg and other places. They're doing marketing for those parks. But the actual National Park Service can't. And so... Um, you know, if, if, if there's interest uh, in, a, in an additional 45 seconds, uh, I'd like to share with you a couple of ideas that, that we have on that. Yes, um, please proceed. So, uh, Steve, if you go to the slide uh, beyond questions, it's down back to the end. Yes, uh, this is the yeah, first one here. So uh, regional signage. And I hope you can make out enough of the details on the map here. So not long after Steve and I got here and got set up, one of the first things we wanted to do was to get proper signage at the park. Uh, you know, and it's, it's amazing uh, what a big difference that makes. 
And that's something we were able to do with Jesmond County. And, uh, and they've been great partners in this handoff, in this transition period. And, you know, we, we were able to, to, to purchase these signs, and, but they're actually not installed inside park property. They're installed out on the roads. Uh, there's a little county road right out in front of the park and, of course, Highway 27. And so we actually partnered with Camp Nelson National Cemetery. And probably more people have heard of Camp Nelson National Cemetery than they have the National Monument, but we're neighbors and our histories are the same. That cemetery that is there today was a cemetery inside the historic Camp Nelson during the Civil War. Um, but they are great partners. So we have some signs now right in front of the park on the county road in front of us and on Highway 27 in front of us. But what we really need are more regional level signs at some of the key arteries around central Kentucky, particularly these red boxes represent, I think, some key spots that would be very helpful coming out of Lexington uh, on on um, Nicholasville Road 27. It would be great coming out of Nicholasville and south side of Nicholasville sign there. But also even over uh, well in further south on 27 uh, down below uh, camp right near Camp Dick Robinson. I was talking to somebody about that before the uh, uh, the program. There's a key intersection with the Danville Road in 27. And why that's key is parables to the west. Mill Springs is to the south and Richmond is to the east. And people that are coming to Camp Nelson, your Civil War tourism from the south, they will come through that intersection. And having a sign there that lets people know that Camp Nelson is is nine miles up the road, I think would be really important. And obviously I-75 uh, at London and Mount Vernon. Now, London, by the way, I threw that on here because of our, our sister new park to the south in Nancy, Kentucky, uh, Mill Springs Battlefield. They're in the same boat we are. Uh, they're, they're new, just like we are. And, and we both, I think, could benefit uh, from more regional signage uh, to steer people who might already be touring the area and are interested in historic sites, but reminding them, hey, you've never heard of Camp Nelson Battlefield because it's not a battlefield, but you might want to see Camp Nelson. Steve? And I'd mention real quick, um, branding is really, really important, too, which we've really been focusing on. The majority of people that have visited the park from their surrounding area, they know of Camp Nelson National Cemetery. Obviously, they've got family members buried there. It's very, very important in the community. Um, the site's managed by the Veterans Administration. Obviously, Camp Nelson National Monument is managed by the National Park Service. So one of the things that we try to be very specific with is Camp Nelson National Monument is a national park site, and the National Cemetery is separate, even though the history is uh, directly connected. There's also like a Camp Nelson RV park on the Kentucky River as well. So we've, you know, when we first got started, people would call us, hey, we're trying to rent, you know, a, a spot on the Kentucky River, like, that's not us. So um, one of our big focuses is, is branding. Yep. To your point a moment ago of trying to get information to folks after hours, does the National Park Service have an app, any kind of digital information that they yes. can access, QR code that takes them to... Very much so. So that the audio the, information or whatever. Absolutely. And and the National Park Service has an app for the entire agency and it's very easy. In fact, it'll use your location to say, Hey, you're closest to Camp Nelson National Monument or Yellowstone or Grand Canyon, wherever you might be. And and it's a great way to quickly get you to that need to know information of how to plan your visit. So the app is wonderful. But we also have our own website and our own social media footprint. Uh, you know, wh whether it's Facebook or Instagram. And by the way, Steve manages all of that and, and is phenomenal at it. And so I highly recommend if, if, if you if you uh, explore sites that way, we would encourage you to explore Camp Nelson that way because we have loads of information. And you can see some of these photographs that I've been talking about, too. So I think that is very helpful. Uh, and once people get to know that Park Service app and they go to Mammoth Cave, because that's a huge national park in Kentucky. And so we know that. And I talk to my friend Barkley Trimble all the time. How do we get people from Mammoth Cave to come to Camp Nelson? You know, and uh, that app is a great way to do that, uh, kind of get them hooked. And then they start exploring out beyond. And I'd also mention that uh, Park Service sites have generally the same operating hours. Uh, currently, just because of our size and our staffing during the summertime, our visitor center is open seven days a week right now which we did not have in 2021. We started that last summer in 22, and they we're doing it uh, the same as well because we've got two buildings open to the public to explore during the day. We've got a park store that was installed and open in January, and we got a museum, we got a park film, and currently we're open seven days a week, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., but it's important to note that the grounds are open sunrise to sunset. 
So we do have a lot of repeat um, visitors that are out there walking the trails, right? They got their headphones on, they're walking their dog. The park is open for everyone, right? And we want to really uh, increase ex- uh, accessibility to everyone to, um, to have them realize it's a non-fee park, by the way. You can go to uh, Camp Nelson anytime you want, and it's free. And then I'll let Ernie talk about uh, regional uh, Civil War tourism, which Ernie and I have a lot of experience in working in Virginia, uh, Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, where there's a lot of Civil War sites at the regional, state, and national level, and it's the same here in Kentucky. You, you guys know tourism, and, and, and like Steve said, we've seen this work in other places, and um, you know I, you can see the map there, and, and that map is not meant to be comprehensive by any means. There are so many other sites in between these blue stars. But, you know, the fact that just in the last few years, we've added two national park units here in central Kentucky to the existing rich Civil War landscape with Richmond and Perryville and uh, Wildcat Battlefield, Abraham Lincoln Birthplace, and, of course, Lexington's loaded with Civil War sites, too. The the idea that I would love to see, uh, but the Park Service can't do it by ourselves, and in some ways we can't even do it at all, but we can help and we we can contribute and facilitate other things to this endeavor. And I talked to Charlotte Reed, our tourism director in Jesmond County about this, but I think it needs to be a regional effort where everybody that's going up and down I-95 every summer to Petersburg, Richmond, Fredericksburg, Manassas, Antietam, Gettysburg, uh, that's wonderful, but come to Kentucky. You could spend that same week in Kentucky and there is more than enough here to see and do. And then in many ways is complicated and fascinating uh, plus horses and bourbon. I mean, just come over here and see this. But I, it, it would be fascinating to see this presented as a regional tourism effort to attract historical tourism, particularly Civil War tourism. Uh, and, and I think folks would be amazed at how much there is here to see uh, if they only just knew. Um, and, and lastly, Steve, um, this is an, a very specific project, but I thought I'd just share it in case anybody's got an idea. So, all right. The, the two pictures, uh, top and bottom uh, left, are, are from a project that was done in 2016 in Knoxville. And, and the 2016 happened to be the centennial of the National Park Service. And so there were efforts made around the country to mark that occasion. In Knoxville, they did it by painting murals in the baggage claim area of their airport that featured the National Park units of eastern Tennessee. Yes, kind of like Mammoth Cave, everybody knew of the Smokies, but... What about Andrew Johnson's house and, and, and Chattanooga, Chickamauga and so many other places? And we were talking about that. I'm a member of the Kentucky National Park Service team that meets monthly to talk about statewide park service things. And we thought, as I said, some of our Kentucky parks were also in Tennessee. And they said, what about that idea? And we said, well, if, if we tried to do that in Kentucky, Louisville would be the proper place to do it. Went down, took this picture in the baggage claim area in, in, in Louisville. If you, maybe you recognize it and it looked like there's some good space there to do something even if it was a smaller scale than what knoxville did a great place to interface with people who may be arriving in kentucky for the first time and this is literally on their way to rent their car (laughs) this spot and so uh again just trying to think uh a little bigger and, and and ways that we could continue that effort to attract more people uh to our national parks in in kentucky just an idea at this point. Just wanted to take advantage of your brain power and, and creativity uh, to plant that seed with y'all. And that's, again, that's all I have. And I, we've taken more time than we should have. And uh, my apologies to the folks, good folks behind me from Harrodsburg. But I'm from Harrodsburg, so hopefully they'll let me off a little bit uh, with that, and, unless there are other questions. We do appreciate that recommendation. We will, we will be considering that. My final quick question before I get to Representative Stalker, um, the the slide just after the trajectory slide we just spoke about <clears throat> the economic contributions to Kentucky's economy is that the Kentucky Magnificent Seven as a whole? It is. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure that it, it is. And but obviously, uh, but it's for 2022, mm-hmm. and so Mill Springs and Camp Nelson would be pretty small in that pie. If, and that's why I didn't even try to bring sure. you just the Camp Nelson show because it, it would be such a small sample. Um, and, and obviously this is a Commonwealth wide body. Uh, however, you know, I do look forward in the next five years to seeing Camp Nelson's uh, pie get a little bigger. Uh, and next time we, we show this. So, Representative Stalker. Hey, I'm right here in the middle. 
Thank you all so much for your presentation. I appreciate you yes. being here. My question for you um, is about the, the slide for the visitations mm. and, and the increase that you all saw. How is it that you m measure and capture those numbers with, I love the fact that things are free, but obviously when you have things that are ticketed, it's easier to track those right. types of um, visitors coming. So I was just curious about how you guys are doing that. Yeah, excellent question. Steve, you want to? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we track uh, numbers and statistics in a couple of different ways. Um, in the visitor center, every person that comes through the building gets tracked, right? So we have uh, the visitor center numbers. As I mentioned, starting in, in 21, we reopened the visitor center really as a first time as a National Park Service unit in June. And we were only open for five days a week. And now during the summertime, we're open for seven days a week, right? So we track every single person that comes inside. Uh, there's also a traffic counter at the entrance as well. And most national park sites have that, right? Um, they basically do um, a really strong estimate of the number of people that are basically crossing this barrier, right? Uh, and so I, I track the numbers every month and I submit the numbers. And so the we use, you know, a couple of different statistics to look at to determine the number of people that are coming in. Um, but as Ernie mentioned, I mean, just from last year, um, visitation in the visitor center has gone up dramatically, right? And that's just from us being more established, more people hearing about us. Um, and, you know, when we're on the ground, we ask visitors, you know, how they heard about us, uh, where they're coming from. As Ernie mentioned, since we're a National Park Service unit now, there are people that just want to see every single national park, right? So... Currently, there are 425 units of the National Park Service. Camp Nelson is 418. That's how new Camp Nelson is. And, um, you know, we've got people that, as Ernie mentioned, they have their passport book. They come in, they get their stamps, and they're like, tell us about this site, right? Uh, if they have kids. Yeah, increasingly, you know, there's a lot of uh, people interested in the Civil War that are coming out as well. And, for example, we had our big um, anniversary of Knoxville two weeks ago. Uh, there were people that drove up from Tennessee, Ohio, um, to um, to come and, and take part in the events. Um, some of the living historians that uh, helped support the event, they drove 15 hours to get here. So um, increasingly, we're seeing, um, you know, increase in social media as well, right? So we see this attention happening. We're seeing more visitation at our programs. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we're tracking people that are that drive through and that come through our doors as well. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you all. Will you be staying for the next presentation or do you need to get back? I'm, I'm afraid that we have to get back okay. as much as I would like to. No, no that's fine. I was um, just going to get a photo with the Jessamine Ga County delegation, but we'll come to you and get it on site. Well, I How hope so. I hope so. And uh, thank you all uh, thank for you. the opportunity uh, to, to address you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's very a, it's informative. On honor. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you at Camp Nelson National Monument. So yes. thank you so much. Thank you all. Next, we will have the Harrodsburg Sester Centennial Commission. If uh, while they're coming to the table, if members will think back to an interim committee last year, we had uh, another presentation. Miss Nancy and David were both here for that as well. But this is another group addressing the same 250th recognition from a different standpoint. Madam Chair. So once you get comfortable, you can things. push the button on your microphone until it illuminates. There we go. And for the record, please introduce yourself and just jump right on into your presentation. Thank you all so much for being here. Helen Dedman, uh, Chair of the Harrodsburg 250th State Appointed uh, Commission. Is it working? Is it? Okay. I'm Nancy Hill. I'm the president of the Harrodsburg Historical Society and the secretary of the uh, Harrodsburg 250th uh, Board of Directors. I'm David Kirkpatrick. I'm the assistant director of the Mercer County Public Library, and I also serve as chair of the history uh, subcommittee for the Harrodsburg 250th. So um, that's kind of a hard act to follow, but we'll do the best we can. Um, we already introduced ourselves. Um, Nancy and, and David are kind of the brains behind the whole operation, and we represent the history committee of the um, Harrodsburg 250th committee. I should have learned how to say sesquintentional, whatever, uh, 
by now, but I haven't quite mastered it. But David's going to start our presentation, and I do want to say my claim to fame is that Adam Bowling, representative from District 87, is my son-in-law. <laughs> well, thank you all for letting us be with you today. As we begin, we want to tell you uh, really two specific things. First of all, I want to give you a brief history of Harrodsburg and how it pertains to the state as a whole, but we also want to reach beyond just talking about Harrodsburg and Mercer County. Uh, we believe that what we're celebrating is monumental in its importance, not only to our local community and the Commonwealth, but it is extremely important to the national development of the United States with the uh, 250th anniversary of that date coming up in a couple of years. So as we talk about what has happened locally for us and the things that we take pride in, we hope that the events that we describe can also be utilized in other places as well. Uh, we want to, we, we have worked to create a committee structure that blends local government and volunteers into a cohesive system. We hope that'll be clear uh, in some of the things that we describe, because when you're in a small community, you've got to have that sort of cooperation to accomplish things that are going to be worth celebrating. We want to showcase some of the partnerships between organizations that exist in our, in our community and in most communities. So you'll see in the picture there, this is from a parade in Harrisburg from many years ago, but that's our Rotary Club. And uh, Service Above Self, of course, is their motto, but it's a great example of what we hope to accomplish with our event as well. Every community has public libraries, civic organizations, historical societies, and when they work together as pre-existing entities, they can accomplish a great deal more than if you're starting from the ground up. Uh, we hope what we present can be easily edited, emulated, and implemented by other communities in the state uh, because we want to not be the end of a celebration. We want to be uh, the flashpoint for what Kentucky is going to be celebrating in the years to come. I'll start by saying Harrodsburg was the first settlement not just in Kentucky. It was the first settlement west of the Allegheny Mountains, founded June 16, 1774, and it has played a very important role in the state uh, moving forward from that date. Uh, culturally, it was the home of a number of Kentucky Derby winners. It's been involved in a number of uh, other artistic projects, including being the home of poets and songwriters as well. Uh, it in the 19th century was considered a very fashionable place to go for national resorts. Uh, very prominent people visited places such as Graham Springs and Greenville Springs, which you'll see again momentarily a restoration effort for that. But uh, we were very central on the map for much of that early uh, antebellum period. Militarily, Harrodsburg has also been featured or been prominent in a number of the conflicts uh, in military service that the United States has been involved in. Uh, the War for American Independence in the West, we tend to think of the American Revolution um, as something that took place east of the mountains. We think of places like Yorktown and uh, the Boston and Charleston, South Carolina, places like that. But we were here. Kentucky was here. And there were very few settlements, but Harrodsburg was one of those. And the defense for Western settlements and what would become the United States was headquartered in Harrodsburg. So we were a part of that. During the Civil War, there was no battle in Harrodsburg, but as we heard from our previous speakers, uh, that part of central Kentucky was heavily involved in recruitment efforts, and we almost uh, had a battle there. Uh, the units that fought at Perryville drew up in formation just south of Harrodsburg before uh, they were able to ascertain the Confederate positions and move further westward. So uh, Harrodsburg was neighbors, were, were still our neighbors, to Perryville Battlefield. And at the time, they said they were close enough you could hear the cannonade in the evenings. And a number of the wounded uh, from both sides were brought and tended in Harrodsburg churches and in Harrodsburg homes. Moving into the 21st century, or 20th century, rather, uh, Company D of the 192nd Tank Battalion was stationed in the Philippines. And there was an article at one point in our local paper, I haven't been able to verify it exactly, but perhaps the first tank casualty of uh, the Second World War could have been from Harrodsburg, but we have to verify that. Regardless of whether that's true or not, they were at the forefront of the American defense in the Pacific. They were stationed in the Philippines and fought valiantly there until the surrender and uh, were part of uh, the Bataan Death March and some of those events afterwards. And uh, of those who did make it home, their testimonies have been recorded by the Department of Military Affairs, and we have copies there in Harrodsburg to remember that sacrifice. So all of these seminal events that are not just part of Kentucky's history, but are part of America's history, 
uh, have a tie to Harrodsburg and Mercer County. Uh, politically, it served as the county seat for Kentucky County, Virginia. So for anyone who does not know, there was a Kentucky County that existed uh, prior to statehood. So if you needed to file a marriage or some sort of land claim or you had a dispute with a neighbor and you live between the Levisa and the Tennessee River, you had to come to Harrodsburg. So it's quite a bit of land. Mercer County is smaller these days, but uh, it, it was central again to that settlement period, to that early development of the Commonwealth. And again, it was home to four governors as well. These instances, as well as many others, have been part of Harrodsburg's identity, and it's been part of how the community has viewed itself. Uh, and from very early on, they've been working to keep that public memory alive. I know I take my kids to uh, national parks and local parks, and maybe because of that, we tend to think of that as a very modern thing to do. But for many people uh, in the 19th century, it was still a very important uh, thing to remember. Harrodsburg has always taken that history very seriously as far back as 1841. And uh, I don't know, I, I tend to think of bounce houses and slushies at summer events. Obviously, they didn't have those. But they felt it was important to celebrate what had happened there. And there was a parade. There were a number of speakers at that time. And that has continued forward through the years in a number of ways, in a number of uh, commemorations. Uh, in celebrating this, though, Harrodsburg has worked very hard uh, to celebrate the pioneering spirit behind uh, what those original settlers were attempting to do. They were attempting to begin something new. They were attempting to try something that no one else had done before. And that is a characteristic we want to pass on to future generations. Um, and this image, I think, sort of encapsulates that. On the left there, you have Dix Dam on the Dix River. And if you go down, it, it still exists today, obviously. It provided electricity for neighborhoods nearby. What's significant about it is it was the largest earth field dam in the world at the time it was constructed in the 1920s. And so there are obviously there are bigger places these days, but it was quite the feat of local engineering and uh, the community and the region took a great deal of pride in that. But at the same time it was being constructed, on the right you see the beginnings of what would become Old Fort Heritage State Park. And so these two uh, events are going on at the same time, these two projects, and it is an example of how the past can serve as the catalyst for moving us forward in a very positive way. Again, we've tried a number of things. Again, parades are great. We still have those, hoping to have one for this event, but we also have uh, our local play on uh, the history of early Kentucky, and that's had a number of manifestations over the years. It's been called uh, the folks on the life of Daniel Boone. It's been called Home is the Hunter. Uh, just a number of uh, reiterations and reincarnations over the years. But it, it's been a favorite not only of uh, local residents, but of the region. And that's something that we hope to continue. And if you notice the date for the souvenir program on the right, uh, in 1924, uh, they had an extremely large celebration and for the, for the 150th. And there was no Fort Herod to have it at. If you go today, there's a place, a very nice amphitheater, where you can see the play. Uh, that did not exist, so they built it temporarily for the celebration and then took it down. But it is an example of just how important these events were to uh, people at that period. And we've had a number of visitors over the years who have shared in that optimism. Uh, in the throes of the Great Depression, President Franklin Roosevelt visited Harrodsburg to dedicate the monument uh, that you'll see there today about the, the settlement in the West. Uh, and it was a time when America was searching for something to look to as permanent, as optimistic, as moving us forward. And he saw parallels between what had happened in Harrodsburg and Mercer County and sought to recognize that with this monument. Uh, again, an example of how the past can inspire us moving forward to accomplish greater things. There have been smaller efforts that may not seem as notable, but certainly for us locally they are, and more importantly, they are sustainable in driving us forward. Morgan Row is the oldest row house in the state, and that exists in Harrodsburg, and Nancy's going to talk some about that. Thank you, David, um, and thank you for having us here. Morgan Row, as David said, is the oldest row house in the state, probably the oldest row house west of the Alleghenies. It was a common um, architectural pattern in the east, but not in this region. In the 
1960s, it was restored by the, it was purchased by the Harrisburg Historical Society and restored. It was originally built around the 1910s um, by a name, guy named Joseph Morgan, and he and his son-in-law, John Childs, um, and Morgan Row is located on Childs Street, uh, they ran it as a tavern and inn, uh, a stagecoach line. And then through the years, it, it became different kinds of businesses. For a while, it was a public, li public library. But uh, it's now the headquarters of the Harrisburg Historical Society, and uh, we maintain it and restored it to as best as we could do it the way it was originally. It still has its original wood floors, and uh, I think probably the bats in the attic are probably the same bats that <laughs> were there. Thank you. So the Harrisburg 250th, as David said, we want to share our experience of getting a celebration like this going, um, hopefully to benefit other communities. It took several years and several iterations for the Harrisburg 250th committee to gel. But the model that we found that worked best was to have members of the board of directors come from the different organizations in town so that the people who are on the board can speak for their organizations and actually get things done, not just citizens in the community who are interested in history. Those people are, are, are valuable too. But if you want to get things done, you need to have the leaders of different organizations. So um, the Arts Council, they're taking care of beautification. Uh, Campbellsville University is a valuable partner. They have space. They have expertise. Um, the Chamber of Commerce, of course. Harrisburg First is an organization that concentrates on events in uh, downtown Harrisburg, putting on uh, festivals and Friday night on Main and things to bring people into downtown. Uh, of course, the Historical Society and the civic organizations, the Lions Club, the Rotary, um, the Mercer County Fair and Horse Show, um, Many of you may know Lemaine Ellis. The Mercer County Fair and Horse Show is the oldest continuous um, county fair in the state, maybe in the country. In the country. In the country. So we're very, very proud of that. And uh, those folks, of course, are key partners for us. The Mercer County Public Library with David, of course, um, his expertise in history, Old Fort Herod State Park. Uh, David Coleman is um, on the board and um, and chair of the events committee, and of course the tourism commission, which is very important for us. Um, and the chair of the 250th board is also the executive director of the tourist commission. So, all these entities struggled to have a unified vision, and then start putting things together. Thank you. So the activities at Morgan Row, um, I've handed out a couple of handouts. One of them is a spreadsheet that details some of the activities that we are um, planning to have um, throughout the town. Of course, the big things like you know music bands and stuff, those have not been settled yet. But David and I, especially, and Helen, have been working on the really history-related programs and events that we want to showcase. So, um, and then there's also another handout that the 250th board is probably going to implement, which is a souvenir program, which has the um, the schedule of events, but will but will also be kind of a glossy colored thing with the history of Harrodsburg and different blurbs about uh, Harrodsburg's highlights and we'll be able to sell uh, advertising for that to, to fund it. So we're planning to do things like having tea with historical characters and th these are all going to be almost all local people. We have a few uh, people that we're going to pay that are Chautauqua characters, but most of them are local people portraying local people so that we'll be able to highlight important people in Harrodsburg's past. We don't have to go, we don't have to go outside of Harrodsburg to find important people who contributed to Kentucky's D 
development and to national development. Um, so we're going to, of course, here the Morgan Row used to be a, a tavern, so we are going to get a liquor license and, and have beer, be able to have beer with historical characters like um, Colonel Chin and W.W. W. Stevenson, who is one of the founders of the Harrodsburg Historical Society. Um, book signings, we have a lady who is writing a, um, a book on the African Americans of Mercer County. We're very excited about that. She's almost done. Um, so we'll have a book signing with her, and she'll give, be able to give a presentation. And we have a, a very interesting character that came from Harrodsburg, Zoe Anderson Norris, uh, who was, became the queen of Bohemia. She was a social reformer and writer in turn of the century New York in the east side. But she came from Harrodsburg, and there's a New York scholar who is writing um, a biography of her. And she's going to come down next year and do some programs about um, Zoe Anderson Norris. And we'll have, of course, guided themed walking tours, ghost tours. We'll have a historical music program. We also, um, and we have some um, 19th century entertainments for children. We have, we'll have old time games. And the Rotary and Kiwanis Clubs are going to help us uh, put those on uh, for, to do 19th century children's games. And then we are also going to have a National History Day type uh, competition for student presentations and um, honor those students who um, do noteworthy presentations. So the Histor Historical Society also owns Old Mud Meeting House, which is the oldest Dutch Reformed church in Kentucky, or probably west of the Alleghenies, uh, built in 1800. Uh, that picture shows Old Mud without its, without its coat. We did, when, we, when it was restored in the 1970s, uh, we did keep the... Um, there's siding on it now to protect it from the elements. But inside is the original, of course, wattle and daub can be seen. It's the only wattle and daub structure still standing in the, re in the Upper South. Uh, so, of course, you can imagine how difficult it is to keep something like that standing. Um, mud is not notoriously long-lived, uh, <laughs> but it's a wonderful old building, and we do have... Uh, church services there sometimes and different kinds of programs and people come out and visit it. There's a large cemetery with many vet, um, Revolutionary War soldiers buried there. All right. And in giving that description so far, we want to uh, go back to our original question of it's great to have the celebration. As I said, we've been having it since 1841 and we think it's very important. But we do not want to repeat ourselves just for the sake of doing that. We wanted to find new ways to reach new audiences. We wanted to find ways to uh, reach every sense because not everyone enjoys reading. Not everybody retains information the same way. How do we make this an event that people are going to remember and carry with them and use it to come back That's going in ways that's going to boost tourism, community awareness, and those sorts of things? And Nancy named several of those. I'm going to briefly go over some of the events we're planning on having at the library. And uh, I've left these vague so I can ramble on a little bit, but poke me if I if I go too far or too long but one of the things we wanted to encourage people to do is to see other parts of our community the historical society as Nancy said on Morgan Row is a great place to host some of these events the public library is a fantastic place to host some of these events we did not want it simply contained to those locations and so for anyone who doesn't know Harrodsburg's town founder disappeared mysteriously and uh, I can go on at great length about that but there was a, a man accused of murdering him, and it's been a, a source of local intrigue for many years. Uh, we are going to have a trial somewhere in town for that gentleman in Abstensia. It has been more than 200 years, so it is unlikely any of the original participants will attend, but we intend to reenact that because our hope is we're going to reach a segment of our population that may not be willing to pick up the book, but if they can sit on a jury for a member of their community or someone that had an influence in the past of their county they're more likely to do that and engage in that way we are currently putting together a children's book 
And this is a partnership we're proud of with our local arts council. They're providing the artwork for this as well to tell the story of our county for fourth and fifth grade students uh, so that we're, again, reaching a demographic that is not just those of us who are adults and, and, and older individuals, but to reach our children and younger people and then reach them in a way that's going to mean something to them and not a plaque on a wall or uh, not someone like me going on for a long period of time, but to have visuals and have wording and descriptions written in a way that's going to be engaging for them and easy to digest. We plan to have a 3D timeline. So we want to have a timeline of events. That's very important to have things in order. I'm a big fan of history and, and getting those things right. But we want to have things on there that people can look at, things that people can touch, things that people can smell, probably not taste, but things that people can smell and feel. What did it feel like to carry uh, buckets of water uphill from a well? What did it smell like in a barn where you're putting in fresh hay every day? What did clothing feel like at that time? How did people engage with each other? We want to have these sorts of things so that people who may not be uh, overly visual can engage and enjoy and participate in our history in the same way that other people have. We're having a storytelling contest. We're looking forward to that. There's a storytelling association here in the state. Some of those residents or some of our residents are members of that. We're looking forward to engaging them. Again, something that anyone can participate in. And what we're doing there, you may not have a good grasp of local history, but that oral tradition is part of what makes us who we are. And so we will have our stories told, our, our local stories, but we also give people the ability to participate in this with a story of their own that may or not, may not relate with the hope of engaging them in a way that's going to drive them to come back for other events. Uh, we hope to bury a time capsule. Again, we don't want this just to be uh, something from the library or the historical society. We want businesses around town. We want schools and civic organizations to provide something to go in there. If it's a, a napkin from La Fonda, our, one of our local Mexican restaurants, that's great. If it's a yearbook from a school, fantastic. But we want to engage people that we have not reached before and tell the stories that we haven't reached before. Because even with the fort itself, I think we get very used to seeing sort of a Fess Parker image but when you read the details behind it, 20% of uh, the residents of Fort Herod in 1777 were enslaved. More than 50 of the 200 people inside the walls were under the age of 13. That's not something you see very often. These are parts of our community. They're part of our story, and we want to find ways to celebrate them in that way. Of course, we'll have selfie stations and things like that that people can utilize um, at will that don't require uh, quite as much um, of oversight from an individual. Again, just to highlight some of our partnerships that continue to grow, we've got a fantastic organization that just started uh, dedicated to African American history. This is our local AME church, and they are going to be having a concert there with some traditional music. We're very glad to have them assisting us. Again, the Arts Council, local churches, uh, the Rotary Club, all, all these groups of people in our town that are pre-existent, that had memberships, that had ways of reaching their members with information, that have volunteers at the ready. We want to engage them. Harrodsburg's always done a great job of that, but there's no reason to reinvent the wheel when you have these organizations who are ready to help and tell their story and to participate. I represent the James Heard Trust for Historic Preservation of Mercer County in Harrodsburg, and one of our biggest um, undertakings 20 years ago was to redo the walking driving tour of Mercer County and it's 82 sites and it corresponds with small uh, it's not small signs in front of the historic site so it was a little dated so you'll see on your left um, the James here we have changed that to a rack card with um, which means you have to have a website to have QR codes so we've updated um, this walking driving tour which is a huge tourism piece you can go into our tourism office and they ask me every time i go have you gotten any more of these brochures but we're hoping that the rack card will update our signs with qr codes as well as make us into this century i guess um, we also on on your right are the cemetery the top one is a cemetery sign a directional sign and we you wouldn't believe how many people you have come and visit our cemetery just to do genealogy. And um, so we have two cemetery, cemeteries, the Spring Hill Cemetery 
and the Maple Grove Cemetery. Obviously, the top picture, that sign's in pretty bad shape, and so one of our goals this last year in anticipation of the 250th celebration is to replace these signs, which we did in both of the um, cemeteries. We have, and we, we are- Sorry, did I advance too quickly? Uh, Go ahead. No, no, that's fine. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, this is the last remaining remnant of the Greenville Springs. Um, the James Hare Trust owns this little piece of property and we are diligently trying to make the spring flow to through the um, property and we will eventually have plantings, um, native plants, and it makes a nice place for people to visit. Uh, we also, and this is kind of about partnerships. This, this brochure was a partnership with tourism and it was a grant also from the Heritage Council and the, the Greenville Springs Preservation, that's a partnership with a local landscaping um, company. This is a, this is called Memorial Acre. It's part of the Fort Herod and it commemorates um, Revolutionary War soldiers. This was done, this acre was done by our local Jane McAfee DAR chapter and it's not in real good shape right now and our goal is to update this and clean the markers as well as maybe do some landscaping. So, um, is that my last slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the other things that I don't have a slide about um, are the a partnership with the local tree board. We have planted up to 60 trees in the last two or three years at, the, at Fort Herod in anticipation of the celebration. We have, uh, the tree board has also planted trees in our local cemeteries, as well as along historic Child Street, where the Morgan Row is. Um, we've also, hold on. Uh, we're also partnering, as Nancy said, with the local newly formed Harrodsburg, we all are partnering with the newly formed Harrodsburg African American Historical Society which will have wonderful events such as the choral concert. They're gonna do some walking driving tours um, on Broadway, a bus tour of, of, their, of a cemetery. Um, the James Hare Trust is very excited about a patent book that we're publishing. Many of you know Candy Atkinson who kind of worked in the basement for the last 45 years. And she just recently retired, but she's helping us with a patent book, which means that if you, know, if you want to research a property, you can find out through, this, through the maps and the patent book, who had your property, which, which um, pioneer or settler had that property, and you can do a long, it's a wonderful genealogy. I don't understand it completely, but it's a wonderful genealogy tool that we will be um, producing and on sale at your event this weekend. Um, we also are gonna have speakers from uh, Kentucky Heritage Council as well, uh, speakers and events from the Kentucky Heritage Council, as well as Kentucky Historical Society. Um, and we, it's, all about, it's all about partnerships. I mean, that's, that's what we've come to find out. And we have a, a wonderful um, partnerships right here with these three representing, uh, hopefully, a lot of the history in Mercer County. And just as a few final thoughts on that, uh, she mentioned this weekend, we want, again, not just 2024 to be a uh, place where Harrodsburg is thought of as, as a center for history, but beginning now. So our K Kentucky History and Genealogy Conference, a statewide conference, is being held at the Mercer County Public Library Friday and Saturday. And we're encouraging people to view that as sort of a kicking off point for the events that are to come. And one last event that we're particularly proud of that you'll see mentioned here, Michael Breeding uh, Media, uh, ran by Michael Breeding, he's the gentleman there in the middle in the, in the checkered sports coat, is a local film uh, company that creates usually uh, documentary type films or shorter films and uh, he does a fantastic job on capturing uh, Kentucky images and he worked at Shaker Village of Pleasant Hill which is in Mercer County for many years and we've partnered with him to create a documentary on Mercer County and we've told him we want it to be exciting and engaging we just don't want it to be interviews uh, and we want lots of imagery again for those people who may be more visual and uh, he's done a, a great job of getting that off the ground. And so we're looking forward to seeing that reach fruition. We're particularly excited about that because we've had, again, a partnership 
between individuals who wanted to donate to that and local entities or uh, civic organizations that have participated. So uh, we've been very pleased just with the number of people who've come forward to assist in that. And uh, we're looking forward to these projects and many, many more that are to come to fruition in the next year. So we want to thank you for your time and support. Again, our goal is to create a revival of local history, not a relic. Uh, we need people to view it as something that's relevant to them today, something they can engage with. We think this is going to lead, once 2024 is over, to greater civic uh, engagement, more community pride, more involvement from uh, people who may not have thought their voice mattered in the past. So thank you very much. Any questions at this time? Thank you all so much for being here today. I am so excited and so proud of the hard work you all have done for many years to get us to, the, to this point. And I wanted you all to share your information with other committee members. Um, did she leave? Okay, seeing any comments or questions? You all explained everything so well, there are no <laughs> questions. Well, we'll hope you will come to Harrodsburg. For Absolutely. Our next and year. Starting this weekend, I think there's even even a cooking show that was sure. filmed at Fort Herod. I think that's going to be premiered later this week. Yes, Miss. That's a that's a um, an episode of A Taste of History. It's, I guess it's a popular yeah. show, yes. and it, it was filmed last year. Yes, very good. Well, we, we will continue this, this week. tracking your good progress, and thank you again so very much for coming and explaining all of your good hard. Thank you for your time. It. Thank you for Safe travels us. going home. Our next meeting will be September the 28th in this same room, probably, at 1 p.m. Just look for your two-week and one-week meeting notices on that. To that point, we certainly appreciate all of our staff keeping us updated and informed. Are there any comments for the good of the group? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Representative Witt.